This will be the video lecture for bulbs in the landscape. Bulbs are a great way to add spring interest, fall interest, to extend your season. They come in a wide variety of colors. They can grow in a wide variety of locations. They flower at times when there's not a lot else going on. You can do kind of crazy shapes of them. Look close, you'll see a little flamingo grown in crocuses here. We basically sell them by their either their major bulbs or their minor bulbs. And the only difference between them is how many are sold in the industry. So there are five major bulbs, tulips, daffodils, crocus, hyacinths, and grape hyacinths. Everything else, no matter how many are sold, are minor bulbs. For your soil preparation, it's going to be the same as just about any other perennial. Moist, well-drained soils with organic amendments in there. The drainage is the key. Drainage, drainage, drainage. I cannot emphasize that enough. You definitely have to make sure you've got good drainage. For our fertilizers, we're going to put half in the spring and half in the fall because that's when bulbs are actively growing. In the spring when they're coming up out of the ground and in the fall when they're putting roots down for the winter. Most of the time we think of our bulbs as naturalizing, meaning they reproduce naturally and they spread and they fill in an area. Tulips and hyacinths really don't. Look at the amount of fertilizer that they need. It's three times that for normal, for regular plants. So a lot of our large commercial properties and our public gardens will treat those as annuals and dig them up after they're done flowering. Roughly, you're going to plant them two to three times the size of the bulb. So for small bulbs, anywhere from two to four inches deep. Larger ones are going to be four inches, four to six inches deep. Common denominator there is roughly in the four inch range. I've already talked about fertilizer. For your foliage, you have to leave the foliage on. I can't emphasize this enough. Roughly six to eight weeks for your larger ones, four to six weeks for your smaller ones. But once you start to see that foliage yellowing, then you can go ahead and cut the foliage off. Plant them with things that take a long time to come out of the ground. Hostas take a while to come out of the ground in the spring. By the time this hosta is really fully grown, you won't even notice those daffodil foliage. Don't do this. Just, just don't. I'm, I'm going to haunt your family if you do it. It's bad. It reduces photosynthesis. If you're going to keep them in the lawn like this, you do have to make sure that you're prepared not to cut your grass until you start to see that foliage yellow. Or you have to use a growth regulator. Here we've got a much taller plant, these daffodils. And if we look close, you'll see that the, the grass in the daffodils is a little bit taller than the outside of the daffodils because it hasn't been cut yet. But they're using a growth regulator on the grass to prevent it from growing so much and overcoming the daffodils. They're great for these huge, massive displays in lawns. So you can see how these have naturalized and, and filled in. What, if, what happens if you're too quick with the foliage removal? Well, you can reduce your flowering. Your plants might not naturalize. They may slowly die over several years. They won't propagate and fill in. So you want to make sure you leave your foliage on for at least that four to six weeks. You don't need them seeding. Remove any seed heads. Chances are the major pests that you're going to have are going to be your four-legged fluffy things, your rabbits and your squirrels, chipmunks, deer. If you go out to plant your bulbs, then you put your soil on top of them, then lay some chicken wire down on top of that and put your mulch on top of that. That helps prevent the digging insects. Interplanting daffodils, which are poisonous with your tulips, helps deter the deer. So there are some things that you can do to help deter these animals. We'll talk about your five major bulbs. We're not really going to talk about any of the minor ones. I'll show you some pictures, but uh, really only going to spend a little bit of time with the major ones. There are nine billion bulbs sold every year. One third of those, or three billion, are tulips. They've been in European gardens since the late 1500s, so it's a very common plant that's been around for a long time. In the 1600s, I think it was about 1635, the entire Dutch economy ran on tulips. It was called tulip mania. I'm, to I'm totally serious. Look it up. It, it was really weird. They're available in a wide variety of, of colors. They're often treated as annuals. You can get lots of different shapes and sizes of them. These are kind of your standard normal tulips. Here's a lily flowering tulip, a peony flowering tulip variegated tulips, variegated foliage on your tulips, and again your peony flowering tulips this time in a lawn. So you can find lots and lots of different varieties. There are species tulips. These are usually smaller. They're not as readily available. They do often naturalize. They don't necessarily need the same care as the big hybrid tulips, but they're not as large. Here's a few different types of species. So you can see they look a little bit different than our regular normal hybrid tulips. 
Daffodils are one of the first major bulbs to flower. They're not the first, but they're one of them. They naturalize readily. They fill in easily. There's lots and lots of hybrids available. They come in tiny little ones all the way up to about 18 inches or, or so. They are poisonous, so you can interplant them, and they tend not to be eaten by the uh, pests. They come in, in a variety of different colors, usually yellows and oranges, sometimes pink, white, some bicolor ones. And you can see they're all very cheerful little flowers, regardless of how you're using them, even if it's this weirdo thing on the lawn. This is probably more typical for how you see them, large masses of daffodils. Crocuses are very early flowering. They're going to probably be the earliest of the major bulbs to flower. You do need a lot of them. You're also going to need a lot of them because chipmunks love them. So chipmunks are going to remove and eat several of them. So if you have hundreds and hundreds of them and chipmunks remove a few, you're not going to notice it. So uh, chipmunks and squirrels do love these, love these things. But if you plant lots of them together like this, you do get a very nice display. And if you had squirrels taking a few of these, you wouldn't even notice that. Hyacinths are another one that we don't typically think of as perennials because they're very, very heavy feeders, but they're extremely fragrant. They're great for cut flowers because of that. They can, uh, often our growers will give the chilling requirements for them right away so that you can have these flowering inside. Um, you do have to be careful. The bulb has this kind of papery coating on it, and inside that there's some powder. Some people are allergic to that, so you might want to wear gloves when you're planting them. But if you look, they have these amazing flowers. They come in a variety of colors. They're really noticeable from a distance, and they smell fantastic. Then our last major one are going to be Muscari or grape hyacinths. These are tiny little guys, four to six inches tall. You would think that because they're tiny little guys that you need a lot, and you do, but that doesn't mean you have to buy a lot because they are aggressive because these guys actually will send their foliage up in the middle of summer, giving them another photosynthetic boost in the middle of summer. So mostly you're going to get your purples and blues, pretty early spring flowering. You can get some nice displays with them. Again, you do kind of need a lot of them to make a good, a good display, but they do fill in and look like they've just kind of taken over, which is okay because they, they go dormant after they're done flowering. I'm kind of going to breeze through these. These are still important. Irises and, and lilies and things like that, they're still important, but we just don't sell as many of those as we do those other five. So this is really only the tip of the iceberg. Here's autumn crocus, which only has leaves in the spring and then flowers in the fall. So you can see you don't have any foliage there. I'll give you an idea that they're tiny little things. These guys flower in like February, March. They could be flowering in the snow, so they love the cold weather. Great way to start your garden and your interest in the winter time. Again, these guys are also pretty early, nice low growing. You can get blues and pinks, so you can see the contrast there. Here it is down here in the lower left-hand corner. Nice blue one. Magic lilies, resurrection lilies are also called naked ladies. They also send their foliage up in the spring, and then they have their flowers in the summertime with no foliage. So you can plant them, double plant them with other things, and then it makes it look like these hostas have, have lily-like flowers. Onions are great because the deer don't really like them because, well, they're onions. They have a nice seed head, which can be another ornamental characteristic. And then you can spray paint those, kind of make it look like Dr. Seuss took over your garden. These are the ads that you see all the time to show you how big they are. They have the lady or the little kid next to the flower so you can see how big the flowers are. They come in a wider variety of colors and sizes and shapes and all kinds of different things, mostly purples. Here's a yellow one. We're doing some weird things with the breeding nowadays, so you can start to see some really funky looking annuals or funky looking alliums or onions. Irises are another very large group of plants. They come in a huge variety of colors and sizes. The bearded iris ones are probably the, the best ones, but you can get irises that grow in the shade. We have native irises. There are tall irises, short dwarf ones. Here you can see kind of a yellow and brown iris purples and whites. This one will grow in the water, so we can find irises for just about any setting. Here's a little dwarf thing, about six inches tall, flowering in March in a variety of different colors. Um, here's one, a taller one in the back. This one doesn't have the beard on them, uh, so it's less susceptible to a lot of the diseases that bearded irises get. They're not as available in as many colors, but they're a little more durable. You want a challenge? Here's Japanese iris. They really need their pH to be low, otherwise they're very difficult to grow, but man, they're really, really pretty. 
Lilies. Can you imagine the cut flower industry without lilies? Tall lilies, short lilies, lilies that hold their flowers straight up, lilies that hold their flowers out, lilies that are not hardy for us, lilies that are fully hardy. Some of them are fragrant. Here's the tiger lily, which everybody's probably familiar with. So there's all kinds of different lilies. They don't usually have too many problems. If you're going for the cut flower industry, this damage that you see here, this is done by lily beetles. Um, that's going to be a problem. But for most homeowners, that's not going to be a problem at all. And we'll finally, we'll finish up with a couple of tender ones. Dahlias. The dahlia people love their dahlias, and they come in a huge variety of colors and shapes and sizes. Here's a cactus flower. Here's a dinner plate flower. Here's a daisy-like flower. Here's a peony-like flower. Here's a little water lily-like flower. And you can see all the different sizes and colors for dahlias here. Gladiolus really more of a cut flower. We don't see it very often in the landscape side of things, but you do see it quite frequently in the cut flower. So you can see these tall spikes of, of different flower colors. And if you want something for the shade, we have that too. So these are caladiums. They're great for the shade. They're grown for their variegated foliage. Some of them have shiny leaves. Some of them have dull leaves. All pinks and reds and purples and whites all mixed all together. So you can find a bulb for just about anything. As always, if you got questions, don't hesitate to get in touch.